So thank you so much for joining us here today. It's such a pleasure uh, to have all of you here. And I'm really excited for this next panel. I'm just going to take a moment to introduce our panelists to you. Um, and then we'll get into this really interesting conversation about a big question that I know I think about a lot, which is, what is learning? Um, so starting from the end, we have Thelma Vajay from CSEMA. Uh, CSEMA is a CSO that uses technology to provide children with platforms where their voices are heard. Now, Thelma manages the National Child Help Call Center for mainland Tanzania. She's a dynamic social, social worker with over nine years experience in supervising and managing child protection programs, parenting education, sexual and reproductive health, and community-based programs. She holds a BA in social work, and she's pursuing a master's degree in social work. And then next, uh, we have Jezri Rudrick, who runs the Angaza Montessori Center. This is a Christian-based Montessori preschool and kindergarten in Dar es Salaam, which caters for children from the age of 18 months to six years. They currently have up to 35 children, and they have ambitious plans to expand their program to more locations, bringing this child-centered Montessori-style education to more kids here in Tanzania. Next, we have Craig Furla, who is the country director of Children in Crossfire, a nonprofit that helps some of the most vulnerable children on the planet who suffer from the injustice of poverty. Craig has spent the last 15 years managing development programs in Tanzania, Zambia, and the wider region. He holds a bachelor's degree in Swahili and African geography from SOAS. And lastly, next to me here, we have Pauline Nguma from Kidogo. She is a pioneer teacher at Kidogo, which is a social enterprise that improves access to quality, affordable, early childhood education and care in East Africa's low-income communities. And she's joined us from Kenya. Pauline is an experienced early childhood development teacher with 15 years of experience in teaching, as well as professional development through teacher training, mentorship, and school administration. She's one of the pioneer teachers with five years as a Kidogo teacher, and she's currently head teacher at the center. So thank you so much for joining us. What we'll do is we'll have a discussion here on stage, and then we're going to open it up, too, for questions uh, from the audience. So if you have any questions, feel free to jot it down. Draw what you're thinking. You've got pens and pencils and crayons at the table. But we're really excited to get you all involved um, in this conversation. Now, we've got some pictures up here which you know, tell us about a certain kind of learning, what a lot of us think about when we think about education. But they don't necessarily encapsulate everything that is involved in learning, um, especially during the early years, which is when kids develop a foundation um, upon, upon which to build as they continue to learn. So Craig, can I start with you? You work extensively in early childhood education. Can you just tell us a little bit what learning means in the early years and, and what quality learning for young children can look like? Thank you, Nisha. Good morning, all. Um, I'm not quite sure how to follow on from Christabel and Melody. Um, that was a really brilliant opening, um, and well done to the Obongo team for giving the children the stage. Learning in the early years. I'm still learning what learning in the early years is, to be honest. Um, but if I, I just always think to myself, and we'll be hearing this a lot, I believe, over the next two days, the idea that a brain is almost fully developed almost fully developed. Let's not worry about the percentages too much. It's almost fully developed in the earliest years before we're actually going to school. And we often think about learning really as being education, knowledge, schooling, teachers. You know, as parents, we want our children to be reading, writing, counting, speaking English as early as possible. That's what we, we're thinking is learning. But that's all happening after our brain is already developed, pretty much. There's only a tiny bit of our brain which remains to develop once we start school. So surely the whole journey of learning is actually taking place before we, at, we start our education. And so what is that learning? I think we'll all have the answers and we'll all have ideas. It can be around emotions. It can be around just understanding space, speed. When you see a car, how fast is that car coming? Is it dangerous? 
When you see the stage here, can I walk off the stage? Am I going to fall? Am I going to get hurt? If there's hot water around, if there's broken glass, whatever it be, all these different areas of our life and our environment and our interactions, that's learning. And it all builds up. Um, and it all happens in those early, early days. Within the womb, before we're born, we're learning. In the first month, we're learning. In the first year, we're learning. In the first three years, we've almost learned from a brain angle as far as we go. And then we talk about the first five years. So, um, you know, I won't dominate the speaking here, but just to say I'm still learning what really learning means. However, I believe that if our brains are developed pretty much fully by three years old, then that whole experience until we're going into a little bit of an older age, that's our learning. And if we can make sure that our children are really getting the opportunity to feel, to learn, understand their environment, feel confident with other peers, be able to create in their mind, then we're really setting them up for what we think is learning in school and education. Thanks. Um, I think, you know, that's a great way to start us off here to really think about, okay, what is the learning that needs to happen before maybe that formal education begins and that I think many of us would agree needs to continue happening throughout life. Um, Jezri, you run a Montessori school and it's a very different kind of approach to education. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you take this child-centered approach to learning through Montessori? Yeah, um, Montessori in a nutshell is about, um, okay, let me first speak on a child point of view. A child is a sensorial being. They do not learn facts through talking and explaining and explaining, but they learn through seeing and touching and feeling. And um, so when we speak their language through their senses, through educating them with materials that can help them learn, then we are helping this child understand their world. And their world is around, all around them is mathematics. They can see, they can calculate water through pouring. I mean, they, that's mathematics, that's calculation. So in the early years of a child, he needs to see and do things. And that's how he understands his world. So I think, yeah. Thank you. And I'm going to take it next to Pauline from Kidogo. Um, you set out to help lear kids learn using a very different model from the typical classroom. And you make this affordable for low-income communities. So can you tell us maybe a couple of stories or, or some ways that the students at your Kidogo centers are really learning through play and how you know that they are learning? OK. As we have said, I'm from vulnerable and poor communities in Kibera. And there, we do learning. As they have said, learning is everywhere. And anytime, anybody can learn. So our kids, they learn in school, at home, uh, when they are in church, in the mosque, and also anywhere. OK, yesterday, I, wa I was in Cocoa Beach. I think that is the name. OK, there I found a lot of children there. They were learning. Learning, it doesn't mean there is a teacher there. No. They do learn by themselves. The activities they do, whatever they do, they have, when they are having that fun, they are learning. So I found those children, they were playing with the sand and water. Does that mean they were learning? They were learning. So I was so happy to see those children learning through play. Thank you. And I've had the pleasure of seeing firsthand how children learn through play at the Kidogo Centers. And it really is amazing. Um, they have shown that this is possible without needing any 
fancy equipment, um, and that, that you can really make this a reality for, for any children. Um, one of the great things is knowing that the children there are in good hands and they're safe. And I think we need to address this, that in order for children to be learning, they also need to first be safe and protected. Uh, Thelma, you run the National Child Protection Hotline. Can you talk a little bit about you know, this kind of prerequisite of child safety and protection and how that ties into learning? Thank you. Um, as the previous speakers have said a lot about learning, yes, learning, I'm not different from them. Learning is a process, is a process that um, will never end. You start learning when you're young and you proceed with learning and eventually you think it will only end when you go to the grave. As an adult, you learn, but also children are learning. And uh, most of the time, we focus on the informal um, procedures or system where children go to school and that is where majority of people are focusing on that children need to just go to school and then they have the teacher and everything. But that is, is not it. Children learn everywhere and we learn everywhere as adults. But um, as a process of learning, it doesn't mean that... Uh, uh, we should follow the system. There are a lot of things that can make a person also learn. Uh, the psychological point of view, the safety of the child, the emotion part of, part, point of it. And that's why as Sisema we have uh, that child help plan where children can also have the avenue to report issues that are, are, are facing them, uh, something that is hurting them, something that is making them happy, something that is exciting them. Because in the process of learning, the lot of things that um, as, as adults or as children, they are facing. So for us, we focus on the the well-being of the child psychologically, having a safe environment at school, having a safe environment at home, having a safe environment uh, in the community where we live, the school buses, and et cetera. So learning will not just go as learning alone, but also the environment that children are in. The parental care, the community, the school environment are also contributing in children's learning. Thank you very much, Thelma. Um, we have our last panelist who, um, I apologize, we had it introduced before, is Zaida Mgala from Uezo. So I'm just going to introduce her quickly uh, and bring her into the conversation. So Zaida is the country coordinator for Uezo Tanzania. She has 10 years secondary teaching experience and 15 years experience working with local and international NGOs. Uh, she's also a writer and the an author of a number of case studies and international peer-reviewed publications. She holds a master's degree in education and believes that education is power. Um, and now, actually, I'm going to throw it to Zaida for the next question, because we are talking a lot about what is learning, but Uwezo actually does a survey of tens of thousands of kids every year in Tanzania and across the region, which asks the question, are our children learning? So we've talked a lot about what we think learning is. Now you're coming in from the assessment side. What is it that, that you have to share around the answer to this question, are our children learning? Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, Uwezo, we are also concerned about the learning of our children. And I understand that many of the panelists have tried to describe what is learning. Uh, we also understand that children learn from different angles, not necessarily in school. But we also understand that there are factors which influence the learning of the child. And we also understand that um, our government has committed to ensure that all our children obtain quality education. And that's why we are moving to the assessment because you can do a lot of things and convince yourself that everything is in order. Things are okay and children are learning. But then for us, we look at the learning, especially in fulfilling the curriculum competencies, the expectations at the education system, uh, and check whether those expectations are fulfilled through the education system. So we assess children from age six to 16 years, and we assess them on basic literacy and numeracy, and we develop our tools, which are very simple tests based on class two level curriculum. 
uh, just on reading in Kiswahili, English, and doing simple numeracy up to subtraction level. And because we are talking about early learning for young children, I'll focus much on data for the young children. For example, we are looking at the access to preschool because we know that um, early learning is foundation for learning. Children acquire uh, various skills, socially, psychologically, emotionally, but also uh, on areas of cognitive development, which is very important for their learning and academic progress at higher levels. So we check on, on access and our data shows that um, in the previous years, uh, many children who were preschool aged, they were not in school. For example, in 2015, our data uh, revealed that um, only 35% of children aged five to six were enrolled to preschool, according to the policy by then. And then in 2017, we have like 22% of the children who are age six, they are out of school. So if we are really uh, concerned and talking about children learning, why are other children still out of school when they are expected to be in school to learn the curriculum uh, set content? Other learnings at home will continue. And that's why we assess children going to school and the out of school, because we understand that even those who are out of school, they are learning something, but they will be lacking something compared to their colleagues who are going to school. Okay. And so, um, so if I can pick up on that point and then we'll yeah. come back to you. Um, you mentioned that children are learning out of school and yeah. a lot of that learning happens together with their mm. parents. Mm. So Pauline, I know that Kidogo uh, works a lot to engage parents in learning with the children. Can you tell us a bit about the importance of getting parents involved with children or any stories that you might have from what you at Kidogo do about that important role that a parent plays to support a child's learning? Okay, thank you. Okay, Kidogo, in Kidogo, at least we engage our parents in making materials. At the center, we use local available resources to make local available materials. We don't buy materials for the kids because at least in those areas we, where we work in Kidogo, they are poor and also the mm, children are affected by vulnerability. That is abuses, uh, drugs, and also single parents. And most of our parents cannot afford to buy those materials. That's why we engage our parents in making those materials for their kids. So in our school, we have material making day for the, for the parents. They come at, at our center to make those material with the teachers. So our teachers and also the parents help the teachers to collect those materials. They collect local available materials resources and to make those local available materials. That is, we use box, bottle tops, bottles, and men anything. Uh, like yesterday, I went and collected a lot of shells by the sea. Those are materials to learn. When you have those shells, children can ma make patterns, they can count, they can do anything with those materials. That's why it is good to engage the parents in there at school to make those materials with the teachers and also they will learn, okay, if I have this material, I'm going to use this material to play with my child and at least it can bring some skills in that child. So, yes. Great, thanks. Well, and I'd also like to encourage everyone, there's going to be so many opportunities here at Building Brains for you to learn from Kidogo, from Children in Crossfire, from BRAC about how we can make our own learning materials um, and really make sure we're creating things that are, are helping um, instill a love of learning in children and, and not just kind of this lecture-based rote memorization. Jesri, can you talk to us a little bit about the kinds of materials that you use in Montessori and how that uh, inspires children to do self-directed learning? Yeah, so we use, um, there's different groups in Montessori, so sensorial, practical life, and all these things are found even at home. 
So there, as um, this lady, what's her name again? Pauline, she was talking about um, making things at home. Even in Montessori, it's the same thing. So we, yeah, it's, it's just the sensorial things that they find at home as well as even in the environment that they use to count. Um, they le uh, we say that children zero to six are sensorial learners, so uh, lots of colors. In their world is full of colors, flowers, um, trees, um, cars, you know. So we use those materials to help them see that um, they can learn through their senses. There's also tactile sense, which is the touch. So we educate that as well using sandpaper and things like that. So yeah. Mm -hmm. it's so, so it's great to hear about, um, you know, these kind of fun sides of learning, but I want to also take it back to, to Thelma. You've been doing quite a lot of work about around child protection, kind of in this changing world now where there's new threats um, that we face with new technology and, and starting to see how this is affecting um, children's safety here in Tanzania. Can you touch on that for a us a bit and then tie it back to how we need to create an enabling environment so children are safe to learn? Yeah, thank you. Um, wow. <laughs> you know, when you're given opportunity, a lot of files are opening in the head and I'm thinking what exactly I should say. But yes, uh, as um, technology is increasing, uh, things are being simplified on learning. Um, many parents sometimes uh, don't uh, rely on uh, the system that Kidogo and Montessori are doing, learning by doing and everything, but uh, they try to focus on using technology to educate their children. Like Akili, yes, something like that, but in the process they're forgetting that uh, technology, yes, it is good, but it is also harmful. So, uh, as 116. Give us some examples of, of maybe what you've been seeing or, or anything that you'd like for the audience to understand uh, about where they yeah, need caution with the work that you've been I, doing. I was going there. Okay. <laughs> I was going there, and um, we have seen a lot of uh, practice where parents are using a lot of mobile devices to show their children a lot of cartoon. Uh, the child is disturbing, the TV will be on, and then they will learn through cartoon rather than learning from their parents. And uh, we know that uh, children learn by doing. If a parent do something right, they will observe and imitate, you know, walk the way parents are doing. But unfortunately, for now, a lot of cases that we receive that uh, children are focusing on um, the, uh, the electronic devices, like they will learn and eventually get to know about internet, Google stuff on internet, but that's also not that safe because eventually there's a lot of uh, online abuse that is happening. Uh, so for now we are, doing, we are focusing on um, educating parents on online child sexual exploitation uh, or the consequences or the impact of children being online for a very long time. It's damaging their brain, but as well, it's uh, limiting the socialization process. So it's, it's complex and it's, there's a lot of things. So what I can say in, in, in summary of it, like everything, when it's too much is harmful. So parents should be careful on um, the way the children are using the de devices, but also to focus more on um, uh, being there for children, not just letting the electronic devices take control, the TV, the smartphone, the internet, and etc. Because eventually when the child is more exposed to that without proper guidance, violence can happen online as well. Yeah. All right, thanks. And so we know it's really important to create this safe and secure environment um, for our children to learn. It's also important that we have a policy environment that is conducive to us being able to help children learn in the best way that they can. Craig, I know you work a lot in the policy space, and can you talk to us a little bit about uh, how policy is either enabling or hindering quality learning right now in the work that you do? Um, thanks, Nisha. I think that quite often when I think of sort of early learning or early childhood development. I use a Swahili um, a proverb. And they talk about vidole vitano, keepy bora. Vidole vitano, keepy bora. Five fingers, which is the best one? Which is the most important digit? Imagine having, not having one, not having two or three, and trying to hold. 
Now, with early childhood development and early learning, we typically look <laughs> at five different areas. We look at parenting. We look at health. We look at protection. We look at health. Did I say health already? I think <laughs> nutrition. And we look at learning. All five of those things go together. And if you miss one of them, then it's going to have an impact on other areas. Can a hungry child really learn? Can a child who is ne neglected or exposed to shouting and abuse, can he or she really learn? If the brain has not been given the right chance from the beginning, we talk about stunting or demavu, but I mean, it just basically means the brain hasn't been given the chance to grow to its potential in the earliest years. If a child is in school and has, their life start has been stunted, will they really learn and reach their, fulfill their full potential? And so we can see that when we're talking about learning and that early childhood, all of these aspects come together, the health, the protection, the learning, the parenting, the nutrition, which is why it's quite compli complicated and why quite often we prefer just to speak about one area, whether it's nutrition, one area, whether it's health or learning. Now, the policy environment in Tanzania, I think we've got a very strong and growing policy environment. Across almost all of those areas, we have policy and strategies, and quite strong ones as well. We have a strong health plan, the one plan for health, across health from conception all the way through to a child who's five years old. We have a multisectoral plan in nutrition. We have a multisectoral plan in ending violence against women and children. We're one of the first countries to make pre-primary education compulsory, to make it part of basic education, to make it free. Making it free is a huge investment. From the point the education and training policy was brought in, and in 2016 we had fee-free education, theoretically that means 1.5 million children have the right to free pre-primary, which is a huge investment. So I think first and foremost, it's to recognize that we do have quite a strong policy environment. Of course, there's gaps within it, and we need to really work out how do we make the most of these policies adding up to each other and not being separate. And one final, just Nisha, one gap which I really think is there in our policy area. Is this three to four year old age? Typically we can reach children from zero to two through the health system. We're able to reach children from around five years old through the schools. But there really is a gap in being able to reach a majority of our children who are three to four years old, and we don't want to lose the gains in the first couple of years, and then suddenly have them exposed to not learning in, their, in that critical part of life. So um, it's a positive policy environment, there's more which can be done, but it always comes down to implementation and practice, which isn't just the government, it's all of us, including parents at the forefront. So I think that's a great note. Na na tumeacha hatujaongea Kiswahili. Tulisema tutaongea kidogo kwa Kiswahili. Kwa hiyo tutaanza kuchanganya sasa. Um uh Craig anasema kwamba tunahitaji kuangalia hawa watoto wa miaka mitatu na minne pia. Um right now we there's a lot of focus kwa wale wa mwaka mmoja mpaka miwili 
and then kuanzia miaka mitano, wanaingia shule. Um, but I'd like us to think about this age group and this gap, as well as what we can all do, su serikali tu ni sisi, um, for the next two days. This is really a chance for you to connect and come together and see how can we work together to fill some of these gaps, solve some of these problems. Sasa ni tena kwa zaida tena. You come in with the numbers, with the statistics. Um, so it's exciting. Sasa watoto wote wanaweza kwenda chekechea kwa mwaka mmoja. Lakini tunajua wote, we all know these kids can go to school now, universal pre-primary, but there's so many children so few teachers, so few resources, uh, and we're trying to do what we can. Uh, what do the numbers say about what's working and, and what's not yet? Um, Jay, watoto wanajifunza? Okay, um, watoto wanajifunza, lakini labda ni, ni seme kidogo uh, kufatia alivosema Craig kuhusu having a very good policy environment. Uh, mwaka F2 na kumi na saba tumeona kwamba watoto wengi sana wamekwenda shule preschool compared to 2015 assessment. As I mentioned earlier, 2015 it was 35%, but 2017, 78%. So you can, you can see that the enrollment doubled, more than doubled. But then um, in school, we also see that the pupil-teacher ratio for preschool was 86 to 1. So, so you that's can, 86. Yeah. Five-year-olds and four-year-olds. Yeah, in preschool for one teacher. teacher. So that, that could be a challenge for teacher to manage such a big number of young kids. But then we also um, look at the nutrition, which uh, Craig has mentioned, and we ask parents, do you provide breakfast to children when they go to school? Especially the old children, but at least look at these younger ones. And it was only 39% of the household in Tanzania who provide breakfast for children before they go to school. And we also collected data to find out how many schools provide food, because we know that nutrition is very important for development of the child cognitively, but also for the health well-being. And in school, it was only 23% of the school which provide meals. So you can imagine these children, if they are coming from very poor family, they don't get meals at home in the morning, then at school they also don't get meal. When it comes to the issue of learning, um, uh, this is the area where uh, it's very sensitive to many people, but we, we reported, for example, in December when we launched our uh, seventh report, assessment report, and there was um, significant improvement on the children performance, especially class three on Kiswahili. In 2011, only 29% of those children in class three were able to read fluently a Kiswahili uh, story. Lakini mwaka jana tulivo toa ripoti yetu, class three, it went up from 29 to 62%. Na hiyo tunaona ni kwa sababu pia ya mchango mkubwa wa serikali katika three hours, the KK, the teaching of the three hours, has really given a push for our children to improve in literacy uh, skills. And tunaona wale wa darasa la saba kwa sababu they were not touched so much by the, the three hours or the KK, performance yao, the trend line is not very sharp compared to class three who um, went through this uh, new uh, teaching approach of the three hours from 2015 up to 2017. But we also look at the parents, do they care engaging themselves with the learning of their children. And nutrition is one, but the second one, do they even bother to open the exercise books of their children and, and check what are the children doing in school? And we, we hear that parents are very busy and only 21% reported that they, they spare time to check exercise books, 21% of the parents. And 66% reported that they spare time to read something with the children, be it a Bible, a newspaper, a storybook. But we wanted just to see whether there's a reading culture at home. Because these children, yes, we expect them to engage with teachers at school, but parents also have a role to support their children, especially building this reading culture at home. So we collect also that information, and we use it for our advocacy and engagement at the community level to encourage parents to follow up on the learning of their children, talk to teachers. For example, only 
of the parents important that they visit the school and talk to teachers about the progress of their children. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I think it's really exciting to hear that the younger children are on this strong trend line. It shows that things are improving. Um, at this point, I'd love to open it up to the audience if anyone has any questions uh, for our panel. Kwanza na shukuru kwa mwaliko. Mimi nazungumza kwa Kiswahili. Sawa. Ah, nimependa alivyosema Craig alivodefine vipi watoto wanasoma. Na nafikiri watoto wanajifunza zaidi kwa kusema kwa kucheza na kuwasiliana nao. Na hii inaweza ikafanyika nyumbani, shule au katika mitaa. Jambo la pili, nafikiri watoto wakati wanajifunza lazima tuangalie misingi mizuri ya mila na maadili yetu ya mtanzania. Kwa tuwafundishe mambo mazuri na nimependa comment ya mgeni rasmi kwamba tuwakataze mambo mabaya na tuwaeleze kwa nini usifanye hivyo. Nafikiri ni kitu cha msingi sana. Lakini jambo la tatu, nafikiri ni muhimu kuangalia mchango wa jamii wazazi, ndugu na jamaa na taasisi nyingine katika kuhakikisha kwamba watoto wanajifunza. Nafikiri hili ni eneo ambalo linahitaji uh, mpango mkubwa zaidi. Kwa kule Zanzibar kwa mfano, mimi natoka madrasa Ali Chadul Program Zanzibar. Television ya taifa inaitwa ZBC sasa hivi, inasema elimu kwa umma. Lengo lake wakati wa mzee Karume ni kwamba natumia platform ya TV kuwafundisha wananchi wakubwa na wadogo. Kwa kuna jukumu la kuandaa programs, kuna mjume nuzungumzea maswala ya parenting. Sasa hivi, hatutengi muda wa kutosha, na mtoto kasema hapa, mwanzo. Hatutengi muda wa kutosha wa kuzungumza na watoto. Tuko busy na mambo ya maisha, na nafikini changamoto kubwa, lazima tuifanyie kazi. Lakini vipi watoto natakiwa tuwa, tuwafundishe. Tuwafundishe katika domains nne utano. Moja tuwa jenge kiafya, michezo ni sehemu moja kubwa ya kwa jenga watoto. So, so ni tasaidia kidogo hapa for, for people who don't understand uh, Kiswahili. Um, so our guest from Zanzibar um, noted a couple of different areas that he really agreed with, but then also wanted to add about the importance of uh, parents really engaging in children's education and also speaking with their children. So talking to your children, engaging in conversation with them, uh, and mention the plans that Zanzibar has to do more programs on television around parenting and really uh, encourage parents and society as a whole to really take a uh, greater part in uh, young children's education. Do we have any other questions for our panelists? I just have one question for Greg. Now, take an example of a country like Japan. I'd like to know, is it possible for Tanzania to create its own customized form of learning that fits within a particular societal and uh, physical environment? Because I believe that, uh, as you said, learning is a continuous process. I, I, I take it as an infinity loop of gathering information and other things of use to the mental capacity. Do you think there is a room for Tanzania to create a unique but also a sustainable manner of learning, of nurturing our young minds? Um, thank you for the question. I think the, the, a couple of quick responses to it. First and foremost, there is a, there's, there's a real um, commitment to have a Tanzanian philosophy behind the education curriculum. Our philosophy comes from a few decades prior when we're talking about Alim Yakutegame, um, self-reliance. And it's still there within the philosophy of the education curriculum. How is it within the learning experiences our children are getting that we're actually turning them into independent young children who can grow into adults, who can really have a contribution to society? So I think that there is, there's, there's a critical area around making sure our education system really reflects a philosophy, which is Tanzanian. Going back to Hamisi here, who was talking about making sure that values, um, uh, principles within our community and our families are part of our education. Yes, I think it is very much um, within our capacity. The only other part which I'd add to it is that it doesn't need huge resources. This is one of the most amazing things and saddest things when it comes to learning opportunities for our children. We all have the capacity to be able to provide different learning opportunities to help their brains grow. From the earliest age, talking to a child. Who can't talk to their child? 
Do we know how important talking to a child is when it comes to their brain development, when it comes to their stimulation and their learning? We can talk to them. And it goes, oh, there's so many different things we can do. Skin to skin, when they're born, breastfeeding for the first six months, talking to a child, making simple play materials out of bottles, out of you know, maize cobs, whatever it be. These are real opportunities for being able to support learning, which is within our resources and capacity. And therefore, going back to the question on, can we have a Tanzanian education philosophy or one which really grows our values? I think we can, because the resources we have. We have the people, we have the traditions, we have the values, we have the maize cobs, we have the plastic bottles, we have the resources around us to really make a learning experience, which is a Tanzanian experience. Um, good morning, my name is Benson Budia from Nairobi, I work for World Leader. I'd like to ask in the 21st century where technology is, uh, is you know, influencing how children are learning, is there evidence, and maybe these two ways, or is there evidence that shows that the use of technology, you know, TV and new media, uh, accelerates uh, learning among our children? Thank you. Thank you for a very challenging question. Um, we have not conducted um, assessment on that area, but um, I remember in 2017, we had included one question for Ubongo team asking um, how many children um, watch the Ubongo TV um, program for learning about numeracy. That's the only question we asked about technology, but we have not um, done uh, a, a big research on that. So it's food for thought for us to consider for the uh, next uh, assessment activities. Thanks. And I guess maybe what I'll add for that is uh, it was actually we worked with a PhD student from yeah. Cambridge University who has used that data from Uezo, including Uezo data going back until before we started broadcasting content um, on TV in Tanzania. Uh, so he's done a multi-year analysis and we'll be releasing uh, that publication soon. But it's exciting because it's really the first evidence uh, that we're seeing over the long term in Tanzania to see that technology can contribute um, to improving learning outcomes. Now, we would never say that it would replace something like school, uh, but, but it is exciting to start to see how um, these other tools can be used to support the great work that's being done in early learning. Um, do we have time for another question? Okay. Asante sana. Naitua, mwena nisimame, naitua Michael Mara, nafanya kazi na shirika naitua Sisema, Thelma is my colleague. Um, mimi ni baba na watoto wawili, na moja yuko hapa leo. Nina, nina maswali matatu kwa panelist wetu ya ufahamu tu, la kwanza kwa Craig, na swali kwa uh, Zaidi na pia kwa Uchuku. Kwa Craig, nitaka kujua, sasa hivi ukiangalia, um, kuna, siju ni seme ni kasumba, ya sisi wazazi um, yani tumetengeneza kamfumo fulani hivi kwamba mtoto anamka asubuhi saa kumi, anachukuliwa na school bus anakwenda shule akitoka shule akirudi nyumbani saa tisa saa kumi, kama amebahatika kurudi mapema anabadilisha tu nguo anaenda madrasa ama anaenda mafundisho ya ya, ya Kikristo mafundisho wanayaita akirudi anafanya homework akifanya homework anakula na lala kesho asubuhi anamka so the circle that's the circle hii hii inasaidia nini katika mada ya leo ya je watoto wanajifunza what is learning katika mazingira hayo una nini la kutuambia na swali kwa kwa za, zaidi zaida. zaida sorry ni je kuna kipimo cha cha kujifunza kwa kutumia mitihani kwa maana sasa hivi tuna, tunaona kwamba pia ukiangalia shule zetu especially hizi uh, ambazo zinajiita English medium schools watoto mpaka wa baby class wana mitihani anapewa mitihani na wanafanyishwa mitihani kwa hiyo huwa anashindwa kuelewa um, kuna mazingira gani sasa katika katika hili na je una ushauri gani kwa wazazi lakini pia una ushauri gani kwa watunga sera swali la mwisho kwa uchuku um, is that kama nimetamka vizuri Ochuka, um, with the Montessori um, system of education, uh, have we ever worked with children with special needs? And does it work? Uh, what's the experience if your answer is yes? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, I've worked with children with special needs, and um, it's so beautiful to see them um, working with those materials because Montessori is all about materials, and there's different groups. There's culture, there is math, there is uh, language, and there is practical life and sensorial. And Montessori is the language for children with special needs. It works perfectly. Why? Because they don't feel pressured, and then um, they're able to see and feel because with children with special needs, they get frustrated if they're being told to do this and this and this. So with the materials that they're able to just go on their own and touch and feel and do, then they're able to feel the joy inside them. So to me, Montessori is the best for children with special needs. Maybe we'll go in reverse order, Zaida next, and, and let's try and keep our answers brief as we've got to get through. Um, okay, thank you for very interesting questions. Kwanza je kuna kipimo maalum cha kupima hawa watoto. I think that's a very good starting point for this discussion in this um, in these two days. Do we really have harmonized and standardized ways of assessing young children? Because even for primary school children, we have challenges of matching the enacted curriculum the taught curriculum and the learned curriculum by the children. What is being assessed sometimes is not what the teacher is teaching. And again, when tunakuja kwenye ili assessment style, it varies. Watoto wadogo wanapewa labda multiple choice questions. How do you tell about they are learning the skills they've obtained kama tu unamwambia atiki mahali? They can just tick. And that has created some challenges even at the upper level of primary education. For example, when we have children who complete primary school and they pass the exam to go to secondary school, but they cannot read, they cannot even write their name. How did they pass? That is the assessment system. Kwa hiyo tunatakiwa tuwe na mfumo wa kupima watoto ambao utakuwa harmonized hata kama watoto wako kwenye English medium because even those in English medium wanafanya mtihani wa serikali wa darasa la saba, wa mtihani wa form 4 sasa kwa watoto wadogo when you look at some of the exam papers from different schools you find that every teacher has a liberty to do what they want to do they can assess anything depending on their own skills and decisions that this is what we want to assess so i'm i'm, I'm afraid that i have not seen a harmonized standard of assessment. Yes, we have the policy um, on pre preschool. The curriculum has been reviewed. Maybe it's now uh, it has been improved. But then, when we come to the issue of assessment, this is something we really need to discuss seriously and see how we can get a good assessment guideline to guide all our teachers in the country and avoid all these confusions of seeing some young children subjected to very serious examinations, which they really don't deserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, thank you, Michael. Um, the, ni kama una kio, umekona angleo kunyumbane kwaitu, na anza kutisutu kwa malabda yo kasumba tunayo. Um, ni kweli, <coughs> if you're asking me, what are the children learning? Are they getting the full learning experience? Firstly, I would say, you know, to encourage parents, they have given an opportunity to their children. They are going to preschool. They are going to pre-primary. It's not every child who gets that opportunity. In fact, when we're talking about Io Kasumba, there's a much larger majority of Tanzanian children and Baohawa Party Hill Forza. Let's go back to those few who do get that chance. I think, yes, they really do get a special opportunity within their school, their preschool environment. But are they getting all of the skills for learning? And it can't just happen at the school. We've got to be thinking how it happens at home. Are they getting the social, the emotional, the creative, the physical, the cognitive, all the, the words of learning? Are they really getting that full experience? No, they're not. And so if they're not, then wana punga kiwa. You need some kind of aspect within their learning. So we need to be aware of parents who can give opportunities to our children to go onto the school bus, to go to school, that the learning doesn't just happen within that routine. There is more they need. 
the final point which I wanted to make, building on Michael, is the opportunity for early learning and early childhood development. The most important one for me in a Tanzanian environment is it is an equalizer in a Sawazisha, those differences which are there within our communities. Out of 1.5 million children, any every year group, there's 1.5 million children. How many get on the school bus? How many go to school? How many really have that varied opportunity to learn? Niwachachistana, particularly when we're talking around those two, three, four years old. Niwachachi sana. The opportunity of early childhood development is if the majority of our children who don't get formal learning opportunities can still get experience to talking, playing, socializing, not being abused, having food, some nutrition, etc., then their brains will grow. They will enter school with their peers, with their brains angalau, at a more even start, which will give them more even opportunities in life. But as it is, the majority of children are not getting the same opportunities as the few. The majority of them are not getting this. But it is within the resources and the capabilities of any household, of any caregiver, to be able to give the most basic learning environments, which is crucial to being able to get a more equal society. So I think that's really my key message as well at the end of this, that we must be thinking about how do the majority get these learning opportunities. That's still Shule too. I love that, and I'd like to tie it back to what Melody had said. One of our rules here is that we are all teachers, right? We can't just depend on the teachers in the classroom. Uh, we have to take it upon ourselves to all engage in children's learning. And it's really actually empowering to hear what Craig has to say, that, that we can all do it. It doesn't take some special certificate or training. Um, all of us have a big role to play, and I'm excited for everyone to learn more about that while we're here. Well, we have one more question. I'm glad, finally, we have a question from a woman. Uh, remember. We're also trying to speak up and speak out. So thank you. I'm Noella, and I'm just a student. <laughs> I am curious about the psychology and the emotions of the child. Most of the students who go to school, um, we're just following like the school timetable and stuff, but there are some kids who suffer emotionally and psychologically due to some kind of situations that happen at home. For example, the parents fighting and having, uh, for example, maybe economic uh, discrepancies and stuff. How do you help such kind of uh, kids who suffer emotionally? Because I am a student, I have grown in a, such kind of environment and I do not want to see maybe the generation behind me or maybe my kids suffering emotionally, all things that I cannot handle maybe as a parent, but as institutions, maybe schools and uh, I don't know, you can at least uh, get some kind of uh, way to assess kids to know how their psychology and emotions are so that they could keep on growing well. Because if a student is suffering psychologically and emotionally, even the brain is like, there's some kind of seizing. So it's not possible for kids to grow well when the uh, brain and the psychology, actually, stuff like that. And then also about the uh, dreams, the child's dreams. We are in school and we are just moving in a certain curriculum and stuff, and then we keep on growing to that. A kid might be dreaming in such kind of curriculum about something, but then when the kid goes back at home, maybe the parent has been illiterate, and the parent maybe thinks of a such kind of other dream that the parent's dreams for the kids, different for the kid's dream. Uh, for a kid to reach somewhere. I think that's a problem which you need to solve at the parents' level and at the kids' level. I think we should look on both sides on how to solve such kind of problem. I, I don't know how you're going to do that. Uh, maybe actually, Thelma, I'd love it if you can speak to these questions a bit because CSEMA, I think, spends so much time listening to kids and have helping to amplify children's voices. So, um, you know, through the opinions that you get from children, do you have anything kind of to add and to address these questions from a kid's point of view? Yes. Um, it's unfortunately that uh, 
I cannot say that um, uh, everybody is doing that, but it's unfortunate that uh, a lot of parents don't realize that they're abusing their children emotionally. And um, the teacher, because uh, on the primary school level, and especially on the government schools, through happy and sad opinion letters, that's the avenue we give children to write to us and tell us what is making them happy and what is making them sad. We have realized that there is a lot of, um, if not uh, physical, that is being seen, that you can identify that this child is physically abused. There's a lot of uh, emotional abuse that is going on within their families, but also within the schools. So in the process of working, yes, we also give uh, the feedback to the government about whatever that is happening, because we write report eventually and tell them. But what I like about uh, what is happening now, the Ministry of Education, through their policy, they decided that uh, in, in this primary school, we have guidance and counseling teachers. They are there to listen to children and talk to them. They might not be very well equipped with the knowledge on how to handle them, but at least that they are there to listen to children. And even in schools that we are operating or we, we are going, we try to equip them with the uh, skills or enough uh, knowledge for them to identify if the children are going through any certain of abuse, not just emotional abuse, which is almost hidden, and it's very difficult for you, know, for you to identify, because the child will appear very fine, but if you're keen enough, you'll know that this child is emotionally abused, and that's hinder even their learning as well. It's, uh, it's, it's act like a blockage for them to identify, to, to get to learn accordingly, but also even to relate with, the, uh, with, with their, 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 their fellows, but also the teacher to child relationship. It's kind of hinder a lot. Um, in terms of dreams where <laughs> the parent has their own dream and the children also have their dream they want to accomplish, A, B, C, D, and then the parents also want the child to accomplish another thing. It's, it's an area that we are lacking, I think, as um, as a nation or as a country, I think the policymakers and us together were supposed to make sure that uh, parents don't drive their dreams into their children. They are different. They want to be different people because uh, you will you see a parent saying, "I want my child to be a doctor," but the child is not having a dream of becoming a doctor. They they envy the pilots or they want to be a teacher. Maybe the teacher is their inspiration and they want to be like teacher. So they will try their level best to make sure that they, they become, because that's what they, they have. But also they are forgetting that we have different abilities. So what you can do sometime, it might be difficult for me to do. So awareness is very important. And that we are also trying as Isema when we do our parenting guidance. We tell teacher, uh, teachers and parents that uh, children are unique, however much we are different. But they're, they're also unique. So to tell them that you shouldn't put your failures or you are you know expectation on the child that they should be like me they should be like so and so just let them be and thrive to be the way they are because in whatever that they are they can thrive to be best in whatever they that they want to be rather than forcing them to be who they're not supposed to be yeah i think that is a wonderful note to end our panel on um I wanna give a huge thank you to all of our panelists here. I know there are more questions for them, but feel free to find them during the break time. Many of them also have booths in our La La Land exhibition area, so please go by their booths. You can engage in conversation with them and find out more about what they do. Uh, instead of asking them the last question I had, I'm gonna ask all of you, and you can write it down on the paper in front of you. So, so the last question we were going to ask, and we're gonna ask it of the whole audience, was if you could choose one skill that with your magic wand, you could help all children in Africa develop this skill, what skill would that be? Nini. Um, so thank you very much. Can I have a round of applause for our panelists?